start recording. Recording October 5, 2021. Started. <laughs> okay, so let's take a look at the critical path. Yesterday we talked about the schedule for just to review what's on the plate for um, current work. We've got the big ideas. If we, at the end of this month, we can start shredding and making filament. Shredding waste plastic, making filament. That will be a major accomplishment for the world of open source. Uh, we're kind of jumbling up around the, the workshops right now, as in we were supposed to do wire arc additive manufacturing today and tomorrow and yesterday. We're continuing on the 3D printer in terms of basic gantry to get things working fully. And there are some issues to, to do to get there. The bigger plan was uh, just as far as the schedule there also so talking about the so after the large printer build uh, the thing we're quite interested about is CNC torch table filament maker plastic shredder In terms of difficulty level plastic CNC torch table is a torch on a CNC gantry if we get the CNC gantry we've got the torch so if in the next day or two we master the axes but, and there are some issues there's a couple of things like for example yesterday uh one of the z motors the the pulley is not on it's just slipping so whoever did that um we got to do the two s it. say it say again yeah that's the better question who didn't do it because it wasn't on tight the procedure there is to get the two set screws untied. I actually do a little dab of crazy glue on a shaft so you can still take it off, but you guarantee more that it does not slip. Because it's one of those things, now we got to take it off. It's not too bad because we can take it off readily, except for the little nuts there on the motor. They're kind of tiny. You're going to have to finagle. We can do it from, without taking it off. I don't think so. It's it's hidden. I mean, uh, the set screw is... I did one. You did? Mm -hmm. Oh, sweet. If you can access it from the side, how can you do that? I think so. I don't think so, because the hole is this way and the set screw is this way, the meat is in there. <laughs> no, let's see. I'd like to record it when you're doing it. That will be magic, surgery. man. <laughs> that will be quantum tunneling on a mega scale. Okay. So, yes, walking through walls. You can walk through walls. However, the chance of that is very low, according to quantum physics. It's, but that stuff is but not zero. It's not zero. Yeah. So, um, if we have the X Y Z axis, we've got torch, easy. Done it in two thousand eight or nine. So why don't we, we did it now? Because we made improvements every single time, and it was one of those things that it's complex enough that you had one group come in. They got so far, then completed. Another group came in, got so far, never completed it. We tried things such as custom stepper drivers mm -hmm. that someone else, someone designed. Uh, cool, but never got completed because that's a development project. What are we doing now? Ramps with external stepper drivers that are super easy and open source, full 100% mm -hmm. full tool chain on it. The other thing that was missing on that at that time marlin wasn't really around mm -hmm. uh, at that time that's a big yeah. so yeah. we didn't do this marlin the simple control software for the 3d printers which we're now using to to run all the cnc machines so those two things wait enough years ignore it and it will go away <laughs> so <laughs> solutions come up what else was was an issue we didn't have the universal access at that time we were basically doing custom design like however we could do it with rails and bearings and all of that no, so it was a complete redesign <clears throat> right now we just get in there and we just build an axis because we we know how to do universal axis now so you tore apart what was working and made something that wasn't working yes cool. because the initial prototype is like look at the first prototype how it looked you can probably see what's wrong with it so uh, well you, let's see if somebody can see what's wrong with it um, Can you do screen sharing or? No? Yeah, but that's what you you were supposed to do, and I am, I am not sharing. Yeah, I'm supposed to do share screen. Oh. Ah, okay. That's, yes, that's please. More like it, yeah. So, 
Let's take a look at the first one. And this is what you'll see all over the internet. Yeah, we did it. CNC torch table, great. We used Linux CNC, in fact, that still exists and it's good software to use. But, uh, I don't know, go to that. Okay, that was the actual, let's see, the actual article. Well, here's stuff, here's cutting, you know, bam, you light it by hand. And it just starts going, but that's all it is. It's just a CNC axis and just had it supported. They turn on the gas and then you cut it. So this kind of thing where right now we have the auto gas control trigger the gas is on. So you don't have to do that. And then so No, I think it's, it's okay. So that was actually, that was some sample cuts. But we did all the wheel plates for when we produced four live tracks, two tracks, production on there. We cut all the wheel plates, all that, all patterns. So that saved us a bunch of time. We cut that in the hours and put it by hand. There we go. By hand. So, but okay, you look at the gantry. You can't see much of the detail, but it's rails, a bunch of bolts. Um, let's see, make zine. Let's take a picture of how it looked actually. But look at it. That's that frame still stands. Mm -hmm. It's actually in a old workshop there, where it is right there. That was the old workshop. Um, but if you look at the design, nightmare. It's a nightmare to put together. How many little bolts and screws do you have there that to do that? You know, blah blah blah, this and that, everything like threaded rod. Uh, this thing is attached with like a bunch of screws. The part count is huge. Unique part count is not huge. That's why we thought, oh, this is really cool. All we're using is tubing, little flat plate, and then like this U channel for the frame. But everything about it is a pain. Like, okay, so it's bolting together it's everything. Track. It's running on this. This is using linear gear rack yeah. and metal gears right now we're doing the belts and stuff like that cool uh, but I mean the learning from that is it's like to fix anything you know you take out part one screw and you know everything kinda falls apart so every screw has to be tight and all that we can't even get one screw on a pulley right right now so uh, if you've got a hundred of them, it just makes it really complicated to maintain. It's, this is not a production machine. So right now with the universal axis, minimal part count. I mean, you got to get the pulley on right. You got to get the rods in and have them stick so they don't slide out. We actually got to close the ends or something, whatever. Much simpler. Um, so we can knock this off in a second if you use... Uh, right now we even have the gas control, which is now under our hand. And you can control that through ramps just turn on one of the pins so uh, but there's only really one well controllable pin that we have ready access to through terminals it's that there's D8, D9, D10 like D9 is open the other ones are they're connected to no there's actually two of them there's uh, the fan and the, the heat bed, no, just the one, because the two other ones, they require thermistors, so you have like temperature sensing, so that kind of complicates things, so you've got one, but you've got plenty of pins on the Arduino Mega. Uh, we, we talked about this before a little bit. Um, let's see. Let's see here. Uh, so going back into the large 3D printer dock, because this is, um, like if we get serious about this and actually do auto gas control, which which is readily doable, it's readily doable, like right now, ramps, take one of the ex the pins that are on ramps, so let's talk about trigger, gas trigger on torch, just for a sec, because um, as we said, if we get the printer, the torch is gas trigger plus XYZ motion, as opposed to extruder plus XYZ motion.
let's duplicate this light. So, so let's talk about gas trigger for torch. <laughs> so first of all, what is this gas trigger stuff on a torch? <laughs> yeah, it's three of them. Because you got to have... How many gases do you need to, to actually work? So look at the 2019 build. Um, here, if you look at the... Okay, so let's look at the... That's the Z-axis. That's our Z-axis right now. So it's riding on an XY. <coughs> you don't need the full Z setup. It's just the Z is axing... The Z-axis is riding on the X. So here's what you saw. Um, that, that is it. So three. You need three. So for auto gas control on a torch, you need a three hose torch. So what we di did is slice apart. That's all you need, that little tip there. And put three hoses on it and run them through the solids. That's a torch. That's it. All you need is a nozzle to send gas through. So you take a, a torch handle. A three, you have to have a three hose torch handle. Which is the head still all put together? Say again. Oh, so that's the, the, the old one. Yeah, you said. <clears throat> oh yeah, we have this. We just have it's that. All put we, together. It's. Just it's a, and you down. see what you see here is like I can't find three hose torch because that's called machine torch and those get mm -hmm. like for some reason they they like to do now two. Some of them have three. So I'm looking for one that has three, and I can't find it. You gotta search a little bit for that. Um, but we have it here. Uh, you know, fifty bucks for this or hundred bucks for this entire torch assembly. Then you just cut off the three hoses, the metal, and put your tubes and connect them to the solenoids. So you connect them. To these three here. Do we have the ignition? Yeah, I think there was something like that. That's it. That's your new torch head. That's that's the equivalent of your extruder. That's now you're cutting. So you got the three solenoids. So let's let's take a picture, uh, copy image, put it in here. So gas trigger for torch. Problem statement. Trigger three gases. What are those gases? Acetylene. Oxygen. Acetylene. Yeah, it's acetylene. Oxygen. And oxygen. Yep. And OSE parts. <laughs> Almost. What's the third gas? It's oxygen again. No. Oxygen, acetylene. Oxygen. Oh, yes. Two, Cutting. Cutting two, oxygen. There's two gases for three valves. Yes. So, so, yeah. so cutting you, oxygen. You start with the acetylene, right? I yeah, mean, so, so so the logic. The order would be, uh, uh, logic. Start with acetylene, you get the flame. So we actually have a, a an igniter on that torch assembly there, too. Nice. Um, which is not shown here, but it's it's on it. Igniter is a neon light high voltage transformer and then a spark element, just one of those like gas stove lighter elements. So we do, but okay, logic, start with acetylene. We can light it by hand, we can use that, use the igniter. I would start by hand, do the igniter once we master the gas flow, because that's an extra, It's you can easily light it up front and, because that would require, Anything here, we talk about debugging. Rapid prototyping means you do the simplest thing. Don't build out the full thing because you're learning. Un until the point where you have production, where you know you have experience of built something already, you don't want to do anything more than you need. So in rapid prototyping, like if you want to get this going, in fact, we could probably just do put the torch on the, the CNC torch table and trigger it manually and cut. That would be sufficient. 
that allows you to not do the, the gas solenoids, which now you have to learn, okay, how do you trigger the pins, etc. But I would hope we do get to, I definitely would want to get to the auto trigger. And I would want to, the igniter is like, it's good. We, we should try to get to it, but it's not as critical. What's the procedure like, for Right, so start with acetylene, light it. So turn on, turn on acetylene, light it, ignite it. Light it is a separate, separate step, I would say. But. Yeah, if you want to be granular about it, indeed. Yeah. Light it, light acetylene. That's my sure. <laughs> light acetylene. Turn on oxygen. This is just the oxygen to get a blue flame. So this is not cutting oxygen. Cutting oxygen, what, what this oxygen does, it's a heating flame. It's not a cutting flame. The cutting flame is where you have a strong, stronger stream of oxygen going straight through. And the way the torch is designed, it has one low pressure. It regulates it such that the, the one oxygen flow is at low pressure. Once you trigger the, trigger the handle, you get the higher pressure. Uh, which is for cutting. So once it, it's molten, it cuts with that pure oxygen. More oxygen means it just blows that, just lights it like paper and blows it through. So turn on oxygen, which is the heating oxygen. In terms of like, you know, safety, the cost of, you know, gas and, and the ease of, you know, operation, maintenance, things like that, maybe even, I don't know, uh, flexibility applications is, is uh, the difference between uh, like a plasma torch setup and a, a laser, you know, setup for this. You know. I don't think anyone uses laser. You could do laser. Laser is like fifty thousand dollars for a laser head. <laughs> so it's not is cheap. Easy, this is fifty dollars, so a thousand X. As far as plasma. Yes, you can do it. Comparable cost, but then consumables are more expensive, like the tips. Um, I think it's altogether more expensive than acetylene. But the thing that gets you is you can only cut so much with a with a plasma. You you'll be good for like up to an inch, which is for most purposes good. But it will be slower, and the machine to do that is gets pretty expensive. To do one inch, you're getting into like five thousand dollar. Okay. Plasma cutters, like thousand dollar cutters, are gonna be like half inch easy, you know. And that's kind of stuff is that's power electronics, so that's actually going down in price. But yeah, for any industrial activity, you're talking about five thousand and up. Whereas once again, the torch head is fifty dollars here. So and and it can do seven inches. This one can do seven inches of steel. So more than what we need right now. So. Oper but op as far as operating costs, why the why the gas control is useful is because then we can, if we go more advanced than this, like this is future work, you would have valves that are proportional, meaning like you that you can fine tune them automatically. So as I mentioned before, you don't need a lot of gas once you're cutting. So you would turn down your acetylene once you start the cut to save gas, so you could reduce your acetylene use say, probably like 75%, wow. which would mean operating costs go down, and oxygen you can get from electrolysis rather easily if you have an off-grid African operation or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, s but the acetylene you still need, but then again, in a future iteration, it's hydrogen. Hydrogen is far superior to acetylene. Like Brown's gas. Yeah. Um, yes. The idea there is it doesn't also carburize, doesn't harden the steel. Like the carbon in the acetylene, it's good for what we want to do for the blades because it actually hardens the blade tips. Uh, so actually, uh, hydrogen would be worse for our purpose because actually hardening of the blades. So you'd have to start with harder steel to get an equivalent uh, grinder, shredder. So and, and the torch does it stay always on? So you have to lift it high enough when you yeah. Well, no. Here, well, work? here you have auto turn on. So as okay. soon as you're done with the hole, gas oh, okay. off. Okay. And you've got 
oxygen and acetylene. Well, for all the travel, like in the more advanced version with the igniter, yeah, you go, turn everything off. Next hole, turn everything on. Okay. That's that's cool because you can save a lot of a lot of money on the gases when you turn them off in all the travels and all that, and you just turn up, turn it on when you need it. Otherwise, it's just on all the time, and that's. So this is like if you have the, the proportional valve, which I haven't even looked into that because they're going to get expensive. They're probably going to be like a few hundred bucks. Uh, adjust like adjustable solenoid valve, gas solenoid valve. Mm, I, I never even Googled it. Well, I did, but I got scared off once I see the prices or um, adjustable. Well, actually what you can do. Oh, yeah. So there's other ways to do it. If uh, These are not a. Are these adjustable? They are hard to find even. Oh, here. Adjustable gas solenoid valve. Um, so, oh, if it's adjustable, so... No, they're actually they're cheap. Okay, so here's how you would do it. It's adjustable, but not electronically. I don't think that's adjustable yeah, electronically. That's, that's you can do it. But then you can have two valves, so turn on one for the regular flow. Then when you're starting to cut, just turn on the other valve which has the low, very low flow, so actually that's quite within the territory of low-cost DIY uh, with basic logic, just turning things on and off. So very cool. Uh, that'll be the next step. We're not doing that. That's more advanced. But that's manual, like uh, how... Well, manual, like you set it at the beginning. You set it once, mm -hmm. and then you turn either the high flow for acetylene or you turn that off and turn on the low flow acetylene valve because they're they're in parallel they're feeding into the same same uh, aperture cool so we can do that inexpensively and we've got these are you know 20 bucks or so each uh, something like that 20 30 40 bucks um, so that's the logic okay but let's look at the mega Arduino mega um, the ramps Let's look at ramps, what we have available to control this. So, um, and we've been, so ramps, well, let's look at um, ramps. So cute in that picture. Little baby face. Yay. Uh, so if you look at this diagram, so that's your ramps. That's all the pins, if you can recognize that. But there's a bunch of pins, like for example, auxiliary here. Tap any one of the, those pins with um, a cord that someone threw in the trash. Those little header cords. Yeah, those simple jumper cables. You tap that. So there's like plus. Uh, there's a bunch of pins out there, ground and and signal. Tap that and turn it on in Marlin G code. And how do you do that? We did that the other day. What was that? It was like, um, actually put it in my pictures. There's a, yeah, so one of these jumpers, you connect it to one of the pins on your ramps, connect the other. So that's a trigger signal. You'd have to go through a solenoid to trigger the solenoid valve. There's a solenoid switch or solid state relay like a DC relay, to trigger the valve itself. So before the valve, you can't really do it through the Arduino. You have to put another, like the solid state relay like we have, um, which, do we get it to work on DC? I think we got it to work on DC. Uh, so one of the relays that we have, you can use that to trigger this, the gas solenoid. So that would be a little project here. Um, and the command there, how do you do that? Look at pictures. I took a picture of this. Look at these guys. <laughs> Just loving it. Okay. Uh, well, there's a picture somewhere. There. There's a secret. It's M104. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we did this the other day, right? So I took this note because we're discussing. You know, 
we're discussing how do you trigger individual pins there's a bo boatload of pins like 50 of them that we still have available on the Arduino um, and that command is M1 no M104 was to heat M42 M42 is a command that you would type in like you, you have g-code files that you put in on Marlin if you type in M42 space P44 that would turn on pin 44 S1 I think that's for one second um, or s whatever that is it's this is this stuff is where do you find this stuff so first of all let's take a look at um, put this in here that's that's our secret codes but where do you learn more about this this is under Marlin documentation so Marlin Marlin M42 set pin state so all you're doing is turning on pins within Marlin so like the M142 sorry M42 um, oh yeah S S is like the level like S0 would be I guess uh, S0 would be to turn it off. The state it is from 0 to 220 to 255. Um, and then you do delay a delay command delay 1000 that does a delay of it's No, how do you do delay here? Where's the 5 what? No, you have to it's, it's another code. What is Yeah, yeah, there's another code for delay which is uh, what's the delay code? Oh, G4 P60000. G4 is the delay. So that delays 60,000 milliseconds. No, uh, that's milliseconds. Yeah. Um, so that's 60 seconds. 60 seconds or so. Yeah, so we would look at G4. Uh, G4. No, what was it? What am I saying? G4, yeah. G4. Uh, G4. Marlin. Dwell. Yeah, so you do G4 for P500. That's in milli milliseconds. Like S and what's S versus P? I don't know. One is seconds, one is whatever. Uh, so that's one second. So you do G4. So we can do this. This is for timing. Um, but anyway, here, the timing, how do we generate this G-code to do this? You could do it completely manually. You can say, uh, well, no, forget about, not, not for the not for the blades. You go into uh, G-code. You could Cura, right, in the preamble, kind of, or, uh, or, yeah. Cura would be one way, um, <coughs> so G4, dwell, Put a link to that, and then the M42 turn on a pin. Right. So that's so like one of these pins, these auxiliary pins. You can just attach one of these wires to it, uh, go to the solid state relay, and that's it. That's really it. Uh, you got you need two wires. One is ground. One is the signal wire. Um, so two here, pin. two pins that you end up using. So one wire per pin. So you, so you can read read up about that. Now generating the cut file. How do you do that? Well, Inkscape does it. Does anyone use Inkscape? Generate cut file. There's many different ways. There's um, one I've used is DXF to G code. No, it's a drawing vector, program. Vector graphics. Um, 
DXF to G code. So DXF is something that's like a two dimensional file. We can get that, export that from FreeCAD. So problem statement, you know, laser cut something. This this is back in Linux CNC. That's the more advanced way to do it, but we're gonna do it. Giant G code from DXF file. We have this on a on the wiki, so you can download this. Let's see where's the actual code that you download. Yeah. Um, if you Google what's the best way, who does this? So so um, who are people that do it do this? It would be um, what is that thing the MPCNC does it? So you can look at how they do it. MPCNC um, cut file generation. Let's. I, I'm looking for DXF to G code. Let's see if. Uh, the actual file is on the wiki because if you have that, that's all you need. You get a DXF file, you run that code, it gets you a G code file, and you put that on your SD card and you put it on the printer. That's and, it. And, and the DXF you get from FreeCAD or you export to DXF? Or? You can export DXF from FreeCAD. Um, yeah. That should be there for, well, for Linux. But, oh man. Is that still gonna be out there? So long ago. It's moved. Source Forge. Is it still here? Yeah, I think it looks like it's still here. Download it. Tool for converting 2D. You can even take DXF, PDF, Postscript to CNC G code. So you can download this. Does this actually work? Yeah, I think it's working. Um, FreeCAD, toolpath generation in FreeCAD, you could also do in FreeCAD directly. There's a path workbench. So, so let's G code. Well, let's G code. Let's look at um, FreeCAD to G-Code. FreeCAD to we have a bunch of stuff here on various functions within FreeCAD. Um, about FreeCAD 101. Where's our G code? Now I, this this is one way to do it. So freak out path workbench. I mean it. You, know, you can take a look at this, but if you have a file, it'll get you the actual G code by running this workbench. Um, but I want to minimize the learning curve. Maybe, maybe I'll look up what's the simplest. I think finding the, the accepted G code, yeah. uh, I think it's probably the simplest. Because yeah. this, this has a little bit of learning curve to it. Mm -hmm. Ironically, maybe they do the 3D, you know, G code, and we need 2D in a sense. So I'm not yeah, sure. <laughs> but they do have that because they do 2D CNC. Okay. Like um, Control F, 2D. Okay. Yeah, like. Um, oh, okay, nice. They're 2.5D, so which means they're just like, you know, your X, Y plus like the head cool moving up and down, just. We'll figure that out. Um, 
not not a hard thing not too hard to do that it's we've done it uh, just gotta look up what the current best thing I think the accepted G code will be the, the best tool um, so let's maybe just link it to here it's a simple one it's a little Python script now okay so you got the torch head um, that's gas trigger so if we take just go to ramps what you need to look at for the pinouts take a look at so the diagram pins I mean this this is what you gotta look at that's, that's just a diagram of all the pins they're numbered like for example you saw 44 so if we connect to this pin right there you'll trigger whatever you got connected to that pin so uh, you have to correlate this to, um, to what we got here ramps pin out Um, or for the most simple thing, if we use turn on the fan, which is the available, we could probably start with that as the easiest thing. Use one version is you put the head at torch head on, you trigger it manually, you cut. We can do that. Uh, that might be step one. Step two would be turn on the oxygen and acetylene just the regular flame and then turn it on using d9 which is the code for turning on blower fan so you have ready terminals you don't have to mess with a solid state relay that's triggering your your solenoid that could by itself trigger your little relay um, but you have to be a little careful about that because upon snapping back, turning off, there's there's some back EMF happening. Oh, okay. So that might fry your board. So I I would be I would, would need go a diode through. Or perhaps, or? Yeah, a diode. So we would do. Right now we have the blower fan. We would connect that output. I would still go through the solid state relay because that will block that back EMF thing. It's mm -hmm. so when you have because a relay is a spring, a coil that's moved by but when, when you spring back you generate electricity it's a generator it's a linear motor but motors are generators too uh, so you get this back back electricity happening that can fry your board uh, so as you see there's detail here that you have to pay attention to just the just the back EMF it's called back electromotive force back voltage that you get from relays um, but that's that so that's gas trigger but let's move on to um, like the bigger like beyond this so there's torch so there's torch to shredder to filament make what happened to filament maker so what exactly is the easiest way to do this so for the shredder we do have our chunky hydraulic motors and we have power cubes so we can couple the shafts directly to them and in fact one convenient way since we've already done it is take the three inch shaft now this is getting pretty industrial here so three inch shaft put the square tubing on it mount the blades through the square holes that so our, our mounting for the blades is the square hole so you don't need any set screws or any stuff like that it's good to use a geometrical shaft so that you don't have to worry about any set screws there otherwise the things slip uh, so, in a heavy-duty application like a shredder, you want a, a shaft that has a geometry like hexagon or something so that you don't slip the blades because there's a lot of force on the blades. Um, and to get, you know, every single blade would have to have a set screw of some sort if you didn't do that, so, which is like impossible to do. Um, so, easiest design with... Um, using what we have here is just take <clears throat> so you've got a hydraulic motor would you want to cover that another day? I think we're already more than busy uh, yeah 
We do, but let's just get a per <laughs> we kind of do, but let's just get a perspective of what's coming if we're going to finish this because you kind of have to if you understand what's in front of you, then you'll be messing around with steps that aren't getting us there. <laughs> I mean, that's the idea. Just just get the whole picture of what's if we wanted to do this what it takes. So, cuz we've got like two good weeks uh, but if we go at the present state of we're just saying, oh, we're just troubleshooting the next and next problem on the printer, it's going to be two weeks, and that's all we're going to do. So you're going to have to understand for yourself, the way you can pace yourself is that, okay, is this critical to, to getting there? And you'll be able to judge, okay, well, that's maybe not, let's move on kind of deal. So you'll be self, self-guided to say, okay, let's move on past certain things. Uh, that, that would be the ideal goal. But here we've got... The hydraulic motors, you got the 3-inch shaft plus square tube. What we did on the wheels on the tractor. So we it's have the to extract thing. the three, uh, uh, hydraulic motor out of... No, we got plenty those. more of those. We got more of those. In fact, we got ones uh, that we can pick up. So the Swagger shop, this the fabricator, they made four more for us. So we've got four more with the sprockets already on them. So three inch, ready to be coupled to three inch shaft. Okay. So they got, they've got shaft with that's three foot long, with a keyway. So they did the keyway because. Uh, so we've got that. So this is the shaft plus square tube, and then you have bearing. So a big three inch bearing here big three inch bearing here and then on the other side that's bearings so we basically need a what a four inch two frame to mount this to yeah so we take two frame. frame perhaps yeah the what <laughs> uh, we have the frame from the cap that emmanuel started <laughs> maybe it's usable no that's too big okay uh, we want to use flats yeah you want to mount the bearings to a flat so there's your bearing set three inch bearing that's three inch bearing the frame would be a simple thing it's flats half by eight you could do so you got your bearings mounted here this is your bearings so your motors are coupled through double sprocket chains so th there's direct couple this is not like chain gear down this is like direct coupled so the chain coupler it which is that square it's this double chain coupler here yeah direct drive double chain coupler and the, the frame is four pieces, and you got to reinforce it. That's uh, how much force we got there? 15,000 inch pound motors. Say boat load, so you're going to do your frame like this. Uh, it's actually a good idea to do this kind of an angle thing if you want to do that, but because that actually gets, gets you more strength. Yeah. Uh, but something like this. But that's simple plate. Cut that on the iron worker. Um, but that's um, that's that, and you got a hopper on it, uh, or you can just be throw a plate stuff under the hydraulic motors, right? Oh yes, you got to mount. So there's more plates. Like for example, here you're gonna mount the motors just like comparable to before, like this on another plate, uh, which is mounted to a base of some sort. Now underneath this, you'd want to have mesh, which like perforated mesh, which uh, that determines the size of particles that will get through. So this, when you throw stuff in there, it will keep getting reground until it falls through a mesh that's under the, the grinders. And the whole sizes in a mesh determine what particles come out of the machine. So uh, we do have some mesh that we can use for this. Or we can actually get some more from a master car. Because uh, we probably want to get like, like uh, 3 8 inch or quarter inch mesh so that the particles of plastic that we're working with are up to like a quarter quarter is, inch is there a chance of like getting I don't know I see it like shredding pushing it down through and like 
problem moving, with? moving like that and just heating stuff up. If the holes are too small. Yeah. So like I could maybe see you have a melted molasses going then at the end? Or? I could see that maybe it's actually good to have an initial screen. I know it makes it into a two-step process, but in this like you can shred it to a certain size. What you can do is you can have a multiple pass process, so you have a big hopper and then a catch bin, yeah. and then you run it through and again. Run it through again. That seems like it might. Be that might be smart, the smart because I'm thinking like big stuff going yeah. down and like just kind of going for a bit and a lot of pressure and heat building up and it just getting gooey well, in there. But you see, like it's going like this. So if it falls down and gets caught there, it gets sent back up. Yeah. So it should work like that. Should do. But maybe not. We'll see. Um, when we've done that with our smaller shredders, we've got the smaller shredder uh, parts here. Uh, but you can see that, yeah, stuff fell through. But that was, yeah. Here you probably want to have like larger holes larger if you're doing like half inch shreds it depends on the spacing between the blades whatever's going to fall through is going to be limited by the size of the aperture like when the blades are going past each other yeah. if you got half an inch like you don't expect particles larger than half inch to go through uh, unless it's like a long strand of something so and if they're tightly spaced if there's space to within like say eighth of an inch i mean you can't have anything more than in theory, half half inch wide, half inch long by one eighth inch. But I mean, it'll like plastic will deform and stuff like that. So, uh, if you have the blades spaced pretty closely, the particles coming out on the other side. I mean, you can't just get, can't just send through huge chunks. What happens is that you keep scraping on that, and the things that through come through have to be pretty small, uh, depending on your blade spacing. Yeah. But that's that's as simple as that. But well, yeah, we could probably try. Probably a first good pass would be no screen at all. Uh, because we'll see what kind of particle size we get after that. And if you have a big bin, like you know, like a thing like this, so we're talking about throwing in a bunch of stuff, like a 55-gallon drum at a time, just collect it all and maybe run it through again, <coughs> you know, or five-gallon buckets as a start. Um, just run it, run it through again if it's too big, or something like that, and then maybe. Maybe first pass is just run it through. The second one, you pass it through with a with a screen, or something like that. So we'll These have are to see. Yeah. Work with when we get there. Yeah. So that's the easiest design for a shredder. It's it's heavy hydraulic. So the motors are run in parallel off a power cube, which is like the micro track or whatever. Uh, the bearings we have experience with shafts. We already did that. Um, and the chain, the coupling, because we have the double chain coupler with a keyway in it, I mean, yeah, we were guaranteed pretty good connection. There's no failure point there. So this is like pretty much guaranteed to work. So what's a, so let's talk about the simplest filament maker. Mm, uh, what's the frame again? Four by half or? Frame is going to be half by eight. By eight. Yeah. Half, yeah. By eight. Okay. Do we have that? half by eight plate. Yeah. yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, we've got that. The plates we moved into the steel rack yeah. mm -hmm. yesterday. So, okay. uh, so easiest design for a filament maker. Uh, there's two parts. One is the extruder part. Well, there's actually three parts. There's an extruder which spits out the molten plastic. There's the tensioner. And then there's the winder. You gotta wind it on a spool. This is talking about a long mass like miles of filament you're putting out so what's the easiest design so OSC filament maker the way we want to be printing we need like a, one of those big like electrical wire drums that's huge like four foot <laughs> yeah that's why we got the big rods on top to hold those yeah. fat spools <clears throat> So this is a simple. So here's a. One one question that's slightly aside. Is there any reason um, to not use a bigger diameter bead of of um, filament? No, there is a case for it. I would go yeah. to. I would make our next filament extruders 
our next extruders, I would go from three to five okay. millimeters, which so doesn't you exist. Grab surface, and yeah, you got you could potentially feed ability to feed faster. Yeah. So you can probably at that point go into like start with about 120 watt heater blocks, which would be the limit of the three millimeter, mm -hmm. and you can probably push it harder. So you, that would be a redesign of the extruder through yeah. a redesign. Yeah. So sorry, that's a total aside. Yep. But the simplest filament maker. This is called the Lyman extruder here. Um, so what is this thing? It's a. It looks like this. That's what it is. So what's in there? All it is is a hopper, a chamber, a tube with an auger connected to a motor. And it has to be kept heated at this tip here. There's that heater. Uh, that's the wine. School of ABS. Yeah, so that's that's um, not adequate, but marginally yes. So okay, what's going on here? That's a uh, 3D printed casing, electronics inside, CNC cut, MDF, copper, all complexity. Don't need any of this. You need a box and a one-inch pipe through it and a motor attached to it and a heater on the bottom. So the get rid of the electronics, we've got the universal controller. Mm -hmm. Same controllers on a torch table uh, or on a big printer. Use that connected to sense the temperature in a heater element. For a heater element you have bands, just these one inch bands, 120 volts. Get a one inch pipe, get a one inch auger through it, attach a motor to it and you're done. Concept is simple. And the auger is something just off the shelf. Off the shelf and that works in, that should work enough to actually get get us what we need. And what's the purpose of the auger? The auger yeah. To move the pellets in. Thank you. To the heat. Smell. Otherwise they would not flow down. An auger is an auger, it moves material. Auger moves material. So that moves the the pellets down. It moves the, uh -huh. the, the pellets, okay. the shred, into the heat zone. Uh, and here, the heat does all the work in principle. Upon startup, you're going to have a bunch of molten mass in there, so that's where you would need some more help. But in principle, the motor power requirements are not too huge because you've got molten plastic, which is relatively easy to move around. It's, it flows. In fact, if you're flowing plastic, this thing would dribble plastic out the bottom. So the auger is... Uh, force requirements on, on that aren't too big. We, can, we have choices of what to do. We can use that same motor that we have there. We can use the... We have that. We have this filament maker in a shop. Um, and maybe actually we can run this for a second to show how it works, but it's not really a purpose. Because this thing has a half inch pipe. I mean, the design here, it's too complicated. Like, that plastic is thin, all the electronics are hidden, you can't see what's going on inside. It's not super transparent, it requires pellets, not regrind. It can't work with regrind, it's too finicky. So it requires very nice, precise pellets. So we need a larger so diameter pipe than this. Go with a larger diameter pipe. So this is our model for what we start with. But the redesign is this. Uh, where's the file? So CAD, let's look at control F, free CAD file, filament extruder assembly, 
Wait, where's the simple? Make sure we get word. Oh, 2021. So where's the file? That's 21. OSC simple. That's called the OSC simple filament maker. So simplify this. So what do we have there? Two by fours, <laughs> wood wood chamber there. All you need to do is keep the hot part away through a metal plate. Um, but let's take a look at it and what it looks like. It's never been built, but the concept is is uh, is a simple one. So this is taking it. for consideration. I don't know if it's something we could uh, rig up uh, with what we have existing or if it's like more of a, a consideration for part design change, but just wanted to get your, your thoughts on it. What's the question? Right? Huh? The, the, the link in the chat? Correct. It was a fit there, right? Well, there's a belt tensioner, like, you oh, know, okay. uh, option for like, Mechanism. Yeah, okay. correct. Yeah, it attaches to the frame versus the uh, the either. Or directly to the step remote, I should say. Okay, let, let's take a look at So the CAD is, I'm just putting the link to the CAD of the new version. Um, Screw? Well, it's it's the Greek, yeah. It's the there's a nut that I guess you can use to uh, you know do the tensioning directly on the assembly, um, and then the yeah it just puts the uh, the belt tensioning on the uh, on the stepper motor versus the idler, and it just gives easier access. Um, I'm not sure if there's a way for us to rate something like that, you know, now with what we have or. You know, there are some STL files on Thingiverse that could be used or modified to possibly use that if you want it. Well, the first, the first comment will be, uh, be a few days to get something like that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if we have the time for that. Yeah. But um, if you think about this, so just a quick comment on yeah. if our axis is like this, so that's the the axis piece and the motor motor is like this the motor piece goes like that um, so our axis is going this way I'll say that's our motor mount piece there the way they have it is that they move the motor out so here you'd have to basically put this assembly put this big green wart on the side somehow yeah that's a that's a complete redesign of stuff but so unless so someone could do it but that's a that would be a few days of work yeah. there yeah. you're basically pushing the motor away Perpendicular to the motor direction. Yeah, that's kind of kind of what it would be. Yeah, I mean it's all doable. Would there be any other advantages in terms of like the enclosure and stuff like that with the motor being out of the frame per se? Mm -hmm. What material is it? Is it plastic? They can be yeah. yeah. Change it. If they, if this STL file. Do whatever you want with it. Um, yeah, it looks plastic to me. Um, there's another one that has one that's blue that looked like it actually was aluminum or something. It was shiny. Um, they modified that a little bit. Yeah. 
Okay, good idea, but not in our critical class at the moment, I think. Okay. Yeah. So. Correct, yeah. So, going back to this thing, what's the simplest way you can go? Uh, so this we can actually make even simpler. Here I try to say, okay, here's your little controller. So let's strip this down. Uh, we're going to get rid of all of this. We don't need that. Run the universal controller to this. So get rid of this, all of this stuff. So I'm, we're going to call it simplified, simplified OSC extruder. Just take away parts. When you want to redesign something, just take stuff away. It's better. Bare minimum. The best part is no part. <laughs> yep. Here's a power supply on the back. Well, no, we, we're going to need a power supply depending on what we're doing for the motor. Um, but we have to decide on what we're doing for the, the motor. Like if we do our standard. This motor we have, the, this kind that, that is shown here. So maybe we just use that and, and use the power. <laughs> uh, power supply. But what's inside? I mean, what do we got inside? Nothing. <laughs> it's just that. It's two pieces of two by four, top and bottom metal plates, little hopper thing. That's it. Uh, so all you got to do is mount some metal to. You can mount this on a wall. I would actually suggest mounting it on a wall. So do it like a back plate. Do some lumber. Uh, do do metal here. Hot is here. So if this all is metal, no problem. By the time you get up here, it's kind of cool. Yeah. Cooled off. Um, this is the hot part. You could even do like put a, a couple of blower fans if we think that that it's too hot there. Our little blower fans. Um, but that's it. But so what's what's in there? You gotta couple the motor to the plate. You gotta have a coupler, um, and you gotta have the auger bit. The auger bit is a hex shape shank, so you can couple it geometrically. It's not shown here because that's a round thing. The trickiest thing here is how do you couple the motor to the to the auger? Because that's that's the boundary, that's the interface. It's a small motor. It's got a half-inch shaft, and it's got a keyway on it. So ideally, you'd have something that's like a half-inch coupler to a uh, whatever the shank is. What I would actually do, because that is a tools out there. Sure, but why not take a socket? and a half inch coupler and weld them together. And there you go. So no machining. Yeah. Weld a, weld a socket onto a half inch coupler. We probably could find a half inch coupler. If not, we can get it off McMaster car, which is like next day delivery here. So uh, unlike Amazon, Amazon's takes a, the one day delivery now takes a week here. <laughs> It used to be one day. <laughs> it's true. McMaster, McMaster Car, yeah, that's in Chicago, but they're like amazingly fast. It's a pretty decent place. Um, so mount the motor. Yeah, we could use that motor that we have that works. We know it works. So um, coupler to it. It's got a keyway on it, so a coupler, half-inch coupler, and then weld the socket so we can grab onto the the hex of the the one-inch auger. So that's the, that's the idea here. That's it, people. We've got the universal controller. So all it is is like this motor is like seventy dollars. The auger bit is like twenty bucks. You got pipe. You got a heater element. So it's very low cost. So, it's a flange. So it's inside a metal that flange. box, that's actually where the the shred enters the tube. Like that, the the blue shaft in there is actually the auger bit. Yeah, the show. auger bit right starts there. like right, right. there. Okay. The flutes might start there, so you're starting to auger that inside. Mm -hmm. um, so that's it. This How is our extruder. Hmm? 
the former, the one that we did here, what we did here was a spool in two hours. That's what it did. That was with a half inch. And, and like here we could probably go a bit faster with the one inch and more heater bands. Here it's like one little heater band. I think it's like 250 watts or so at the tip. That's so all we did. Yeah, you do. You gotta have a spooler. So that's this is the easy part, people. This is easy. Um, let's see. So uh, let's paste. Let's copy and paste this. This is this is the concept. We can build this readily. So the tensioner and the winder, those are the things that are a little more work, but we have them from the last version so we can actually take them out. What we do have oh, that's all there. Yeah, so let's take a look at this post here. That's that's what you have there. Now this we gotta beef up a little bit so it's a little motor that's spinning a shaft and and this this turns on whenever it's triggered in an on off very simple binary way um let's see maybe take a look at the video here um how do we get into that video Yeah, but all it is is um, you're you're triggering it on and off. What's happening there? It stops and st starts. No, that maybe. So there's that trigger thing back there. It just starts by itself whenever that filament hits a little lever. This is that. No, gotcha. Yeah. In the L bracket, then it's this thing the back board. there. Okay. So that is called the tensioner, and that is called the spooler, but they're really like one unit. See, it triggers up on that, goes through that slit up and down when it hits up. It hits one trigger, when it goes down, it hits another trigger. And it's just simple turning on these motors. One turns it on, another turns it off. The, I mean, this thing, that this is called the tensioner, this thing. Because it once the filament starts drooping, it goes through the floor, it triggers. Once it's too tight, it triggers and the motors start. Can you picture that? Yeah. Yep. But that's a we have those parts actually here. We have this exact setup, but I mean this this is like rubber great, band and right there is just over a box around the power supply, yeah. Underneath the filament. Yeah. Power yeah. supply, two switches. Those are just switches that are um, actually speed control. Those are little speed controls for the motor. The, the two little motors here. Now these little motors, I think they can work. They're strong enough for like little spools like this. I mean, if we get spools like this, if we can start cranking out two pound spools, that would be cool. Um, and uh, we could even gear this tiny motor down a little more. But here, like as you see, it's uh, we got a couple of properties. All it is is 
it's driving the actual spool through the that little thing there. It's just a contact. This contact wheel. Contact wheel. Gotcha. Should probably print something a little better there. Um, yeah, this 3D printer has got like duct tape on it, but this is like completely welfare. Um, but that's this is a Lyman filament maker. That's the state of art in open source. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if there's anything better for spoolers and winders right now. Uh, we can take a look, but I mean, all it is is you gotta turn on the spool to wind it every so often, or you can sit there by hand and just keep winding it for two hours per spool. <laughs> You'll get paid ten dollars an hour because the spool is twenty dollars. <laughs> But if we're actually spinning this out faster, you'll be getting paid 20 bucks an hour. Say where the production rate is actually two spools in two hours, so every hour you get $20 worth of value. Uh, well, actually, if you're running a whole cluster of these, like you got five of these that you're just spinning on a on a big roller, that that would be the idea. Get get like four of these things, a bank of four of these, and then you can have a heavier motor, and that heavier motor could be run. Uh, it would actually be easy to use the universal controller. The universal controller that also is connected to this. That each one is feeding the exact same speed. No. It's a common hopper. Um, you got to have all your extruders. Yeah. Yeah, that's exact same yeah, speed. that's yeah. You can't can't really bank it up too much, mm -hmm. unless. How do you make it extrude at the same speed? You you don't. I mean, it's. I mean, you have to have like four independent systems, really. So, but a person could sit there and crank both of them, and you're getting forty bucks an hour to make filament. Yeah. Um, we set it up as a little rowing machine, and then we charge people. Do it. And charge people in the experience economy. Yeah. So that could be. A good feature for your ecotourism spot. Yeah. Hundred dollars an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah well, there's so, a wonderful small scale value proposition right there that is incredibly successful. Yeah. That this is this part is huge here. I would consider that as a, as a spin-off of the main like housing enterprise. So once we crack this, that's housing enterprise, plastic enterprise, solving two problems. You're solving housing and you're solving plastic. Um, one consideration in regards to printing lumber and such, um, there's I mean, for internal walls, for non-load bearing, that's totally fine. But even if it is structurally sound for it, there is no code around using plastic structural lumber. And that is a major stumbling block. To take this further, that naturally means that that process is developed through this, this process. We have to develop that as well. For this to be used in anything but non-structural or decorative, which is still decent, like trim and things like that, or foundation forms, etc. Uh, that means going through building, building department, not building department, but code authority approval. So testing yeah. and data collection and all of that. That's part of this yeah. game, yeah. which is going to cost like a million bucks or so once, yeah. and then we have it. So, and then it's open. Yeah. It's going to be an open standard like the first open standard DIN 3105 that defines what open source hardware is. Yeah. Yeah. You get people building an organ with it too because they don't have the building code. Uh -huh. so. like, like period? Period, yeah. No. Wow. That's scary. Mm, in the cities you have codes. But yeah, in the city. But like okay. once you get He's out, exaggerating yeah, a little bit. Okay. <laughs> I got you. I mean, half, you just going to say 50% because 50% 50 of the people live in cities. Yeah, I mean, good sections of <laughs> do not have any. Really but that's true that. for anywhere. Anywhere you're out of, out of the city, you pretty much ain't got codes. You go two hours from a million 
person in Metropolis, you're free. Are you? Though, I mean, they might not get in the course to apply, they but they still apply. It. But they actually yeah, don't. Yeah, there's have, laws everywhere. They actually yeah. don't have to. Just like that, Mississippi. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, yeah but but we, we, well, here we don't. We don't. We have, don't. Okay, there you go. Great. There's about 40 counties in the United States that don't have codes, right. or build, rather building departments yeah. to enforce codes. Yes. Or building, like, Google Pockets of Freedom. <laughs> this is a map that shows the green shows places which have no building codes. There you go. So for Oregon, yeah, it's just sections. I mean, but Texas seems to be the most freedom-loving republic there. Yeah. And oh yeah, New Mexico. New Mexico, yeah, there you go. If you can carry your gun out on that, I guess. But California. Huh? Okay, anyway. There's. Um, <laughs> Go south. <laughs> yes. Any potential material prohibitions with using square chambers for the shredder and for the filament as opposed to you know, material one getting stuck in a corner. Yeah, it's going to get stuck in a corner. Like yeah, it's going to get stuck in a corner. <clears throat> but uh, if you don't like that, put in a, put in sides. We can put in sides. Um, yeah, it's it would be a sensible idea to put in pieces of wood there as sides, so that you have that space. But if you want it to be done with it faster, you don't even have to do that. It'll just be there, and it will pollute your next batch. Of whatever you have if that's an issue yeah but yeah this is like simplest simplest uh, the square corners will be uh, an issue in that sense yes mm -hmm. so what next well so that will be uh, that's kind of what's laying ahead the the torch uh, torch is a big one, uh, but the axes first. So, but axes first. If we got the axes, we got the torch. If we got the torch, we got the shredder. After the shredder, um, then it's extruder is easy. The winder is gonna be the most challenging, but it's nothing, nothing particularly challenging. It's still what we have there was the small on and off switch logic, which we have and that's all done so if we just replicate that nothing too too difficult about that it's just two little uh, switches little limit switches with a long long lever on them and we have that part already there so we can reuse that and you're just turning on little little motors to do the winder but the winder the only thing I guess the most to be specific about the winder that we can do what what already exists there driving the actual spool but we have to just make the structure there more solid. You saw the rubber band to tension it and you know, make that a little better. But none of this is too particularly hard. Now to scale this to industrial production, yeah, you'd have to scale it up, maybe do a bank. I, I do like the bank idea. Just have a bunch of bank, meaning like four of these extruders have the, or even do this same thing here, same chamber, just make this a longer thing. Just have four heads popping down, same hopper. I mean, we should do something like that. I mean, do one first. After we do the first one, then put like four heads on this, because the parts are cheap. You know, it's like a hundred bucks per, a hundred fifty or so per the next head. And yeah, and that gets you into like four filament streams. That's getting into something that would be a business. Now, if it does take two two hours per spool already, I mean, that's still huge value. That's twelve spool, like you know, ten a dozen spools a day. That's 240 bucks in the market. So, per day. If it's running automated, then you're not even babysitting it. And but right there is already a business. I mean, that's specifically to feeding printers that can print this, like... Well, if, depending what you put into it, you can start, you can do, like, PLA, you can get PLA off the shelf or, like, PLA regrind and stuff. <laughs> You, you can, can work with that. Okay. Yeah, you can get any kind of plastic and regrind form. Separated into it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then for the people that 
do have the advanced printers, they can print with anything. Yeah. But that won't be for everybody. Okay. And the economic goal is to reduce the cost by not having to buy new filament? It's to recycle. Okay. Well, yeah, the, the numbers are actually 1,000x for the cost reduction because a spool costs you 20 bucks, okay. pellets cost you a dollar a pound or a kilo, regrind or trash bales cost you like a few cents a kilo. So it's literally like a 1,000x cost reduction and honestly, of the like, material cost. And a spool is a kilo? Spool is a kilo. It costs twenty bucks. And honestly, like, like we have a big recycling center where where I am, and I'm watching bales and bales and bales pile up. Like they they have nowhere to go with it anymore. China right. doesn't want it anymore, and like they're giving it away basically. So the 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 printer you're talking about this is for for vocation, right? So that can be basically screwed to any type of plastic. Uh, I mean, the extruder is not the issue, the chamber, heat chamber, the chamber. is the yeah. issue. And that has to be tuned to the the mix, right? Because each mix... Just temperature. It's basically temperature and speed of extrusion. Yeah, but I'm saying, like, if one is not, like, having a clear recipe of what's going in, that's going to determine, like, where you find that you kind of have to have a... Um, stable recipe going. Yes, here, right? that determines. Have, like, your temperature will need to go up. Yeah, exactly. Up. That determines what, what is technically technically known as filament. It's called shit filament. And if you have, uh, you can get away with a lot. Like if you've got a basic formula, once you s start trying to print like engineered material, you have to know exactly what you need. But for non-structural or just bulk printing aspects like say you want to print your foundation forms or plastic lumber it could be a mix of various things yeah. they have to be compatible like some plastics don't stick to one another yeah. others do so there's a whole realm of thousands of different formulas that that are a project onto their own mm -hmm. but with basic principles you can mix there's a lot of miscibility that that is allowed and some things that just don't uh, if they don't, you might have, maybe that's a feature, like say you print a, a skin of one material and infill of another that doesn't stick to it, I don't know, whatever. Yeah, but there's, yeah, it's, uh, there's a lot of flexibility there to what you can do. Um, it's a whole science unto itself. But you get to basically screen the plastic and then you can, I don't know, uh, bottle, bottle, uh, plastic bottles, uh, you can do a type of... Uh, I don't know, like a shrimp or or something that is, is not yeah. structural. But a uh, yogurt uh, bottle, you go more into structural stuff because it's got yeah. Be yeah, plastics have all kinds of different mm -hmm. properties from like, like a couple of thousand PSI to like 10,000 PSI or so. so. Yeah, there's all kinds of different properties and temperature melting points from your like 200 area or 180 to like 450 and stuff. So, um, and yeah. Part of the problem is every plastic is a, is a blend. You know, like this plastic bottle right here is HDPE, you know, LED, polypropylene, right? And so there's probably three different plastics at least. <coughs> you make like an average plastic bottle, the hard part of the bottle is different from the squishy part of the middle, it's different from the well, you might have to separate, you might have to pre-process as needed. You can get you can get separated bales, you can get complete mixed bales, whatever. I mean, look how much trash we're making here. Yeah, Jeff's burning like, like ten bags a week, and half of that is plastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like that all should be going in a shredder. So yeah. hopefully yeah. we get that sooner yeah. than later. I, 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 like, I think the, the bottleneck here and what we're not even thinking about is screening the plastic under, and I think that's a whole problem, right? So. Yeah, but I mean, 
to a basic level like and uh, depends what percentage like if you've got say primarily we're like using up I don't know plastic cups we've got a little bit of this polyethylene with it if it's a small part you can you know it depends what percentage it is but in an ideal situation you yeah you work out your basic process it will be definite process engineering like you gotta work out what works but once you get it I think That's it'll be pretty we've pretty got robust test it out. We're yeah yeah but I mean there's definitely bulk sources of uniform plastic like for example all the you know the PVC plastic that we have here that are scraps from plumbing projects or whatever there's you know we got a whole bucket of PLA already and stuff like that it's there's plenty of resource on that so we're not short of resource on that it's actually enough for about a hundred about 10 million houses if they were all plastic per year from the global supply chain uh, of, pl of, of plastic that goes to the trash not recycled 10 million houses so it's like I thought it would be much lower but that's actually quite a bit of houses you can build uh, in terms of like, if you make plastic lumber or wood infill plastic lumber which kind of smells like wood even you know just plastic plastic with like wood powder or tiny pieces of wood. That's that's what and wood that filament goes in is. The extruder. Yeah, you mix it all up and and uh, extrude it. So you can do all kinds of additives. You can add if you add enough metal powder, you're printing. You can print metal objects, which then you have to burn out, and then you get a hundred percent metal object. That's another way to go. I don't know if you guys have heard about that. Yeah. Um, much, metal filaments. How much are the filaments metal? Hundred percent. Once you burn out the the other stuff, so there's um, uh, oh, so no, like but inside in the plastic it would be probably like about thirty percent or thirty to seventy percent. So you you can do that, but that's there's companies that do that, and that's actually awesome area for R and D. Like, how do you work out? Uh, there's a thing called metal injection molding. How do they do that? What is that? That's metal powder in a plastic matrix and then you burn out the plastic and you get a hundred percent kind of like a centered metal structure so it's not like the the, the great strength it'll be like it's a centered strong, yeah. centered strong yeah you got porosity but yeah that that works I mean that's how some of these companies do it you you bake your part you print it you bake it and then it's a hundred percent metal part yeah, but the citrine is fairly, I mean, it, it, that needs to be fairly controlled to process. Oh, yeah. Stuff, and it shrinks maybe 30% at the part, so that's why it has to be reasonably yeah. controlled. It has to be tightly controlled, but the tight control is on a powder. How do you generate that powder? That's a ball mill. Uh, metal powders, that's the hard part. If you got those metal powders, like imagine <coughs> stainless steel. But like um, recycling parts, like metal parts, and make it powder? Or? Or you buy the powder? Or you, you, I mean, metal powder, like stainless steel powder, what is that? It's it's stain, it's stain steel that, you know, take a look at. If you're powdering things that rust, then you have to do it in an inert environment. But if you're powdering stainless steel, I don't know how they do it, but it, that's that's powdered stainless steel. It's it's a ball mill. It's ball milled metal. Put the put metal in a ball mill, it just crumbles up. Ball mill is a cylinder with big balls that just keep smashing uh, thing into nano nanoparticle sizes. Talking about nanometer scale particles. This is nanotech. That's advanced. This is advanced stuff. But it's, it's relatively easy to get. Like for the stainless, like I guess you can put stainless steel inside a regular ball mill. But for other things that rust, because the surface area is so huge, it'll just rust or oxidize. So you don't have that pure powder anymore. So you probably need an inert chamber to do this with most metals. But that's a well established technology. So, axes. Uh, do the axes, but there's more like 
what about the okay so there's would be the spool holder that will be parts we can print out for the top like we have the the big rod on top we can put another rod across that we can print out a little connector like the small spool holder that we have I don't know if you guys the spool holder um, what's a spool holder Uh, look at say uh, D3D. Did it travel with the header with the gantry uh, <coughs> or uh, just point point fixed the, on the frame? It's high the spool yeah. holder. It, it's uh, no, it's just held up there on the big vertical bars. But it has to be high up then. So yeah, it has to be high up. The, so if you take a look at. What is the spool holder? It's this thing. It's a thing that connects. If you have the one inch rods, do this thing. It's got a hole in one side and hole in the other, and you can connect two, two rods at a right angle, print one of these. And then the, what's, what's it called? The chain, the, what do we call the? I don't know what you uh, what's it called? The the wire, uh, wire, wire hole, guide, wire yeah. guide. Uh, we want to probably like these. I don't think we want what we have here, which are these things. They're like way too massive. We sh we can redesign a very simple version of that. Basically, things that snap into each other and they can rotate. That's a simple redesign thing. Um, I was actually thinking for this, just use a screw. Since this is kind of hard to print because those those pegs they're kind of against gravity, so we could do a simple structure where you just put in like a screw. Like we've got plenty of those black screws. Like at every joint, you got this screw. So put holes into this and put a little pin screw. It'll be a quick thing for something that will be very strong and easy to print. Like I was thinking. Push a rod through the middle of that. Yeah, through every. Well, that might be where the cables are going, but. Well, they would go, yeah, like cables would fall to the bottom, this thing would be like over the top, something like that, but just I mean, we, we need just to, to be on the same page, so basically put a screw yeah. in here and yeah. perhaps here. Yeah, okay. uh, and then make these things longer, make them like three inches long, so we only need so many of them. I mean, the area we're spanning is pretty huge, so if you make them like two or three inches per and we can get the whole cluster of printers printing. Um, that's where you'd need like a cluster that will be useful to run all the printers on it to, to make these things. So there's that. What else is missing from completion on there? So there's the bed. Um, Do we know how to mount the printhead? Is that already can? Down I think. Yeah. Can you mount it already? Oh yeah. You mounted it. Yeah. Let's just do a map. <coughs> Same as the small printer. That's good. Um, anything else missing from getting all the axes? So there's the one one pulley that's not not attached. Uh, the belt tensioning is something to do. We're get so right now we're getting the like the weight. I'm working on that. The weight. Oh, we're doing the counterweight. So uh, do we have the four pieces printing for the the idler pieces? Would be the yeah, easiest they, solution they right now. Yeah, they are printed overnight. I guess I've seen some have watched. But okay. We'll see. Okay, so that's an easy solution for that, and get a piece of steel like uh, do like a one by one by six little slab of steel, like 20 pounds on each side or 40 pounds on each side. Maybe get some some bolt mounting system where we can put on additional plates to take them out. Yeah. Yeah. So that would be cool. So maybe a slab going for the plate. Could, could be like a plate, and then hang the next one, hang the next one off it, or to the side. What's a good start for a piece? Because we only need twenty pounds. Twenty pounds. So twenty pounds. Like twenty-five pounds to equal the weight of the bed. With the hole through, basically. Yeah. So you got the Z going up and down, string that goes like that, and like that, and there's a bar of steel, yeah. right there. Same thing as yeah. that. Uh, just do a hole. Uh, you don't need those plastic holders, just, you can just do that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, but it keeps the old screw and the other ones. They're connected to the carriage. Yeah, we're just putting together holes of colors. 
17 per motor, so times four is 64 pounds of uplift with the tensioning that we already have. Mm -hmm. We pressed harder on the tension that we were getting like 27 pounds mm -hmm. per motor. So with a counterweight, we should be pretty good at this point. So we'll see if that, that is good. And yeah, the counterweights need to be the same weight as the bed, basically. Yeah. yeah, and that would like neutralize your forces there. Yeah. But make sure we got the, I mean, either piece is already have the bearing structure that you can run the wire so it's a smooth, smooth wind around that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. But they can run on the 8 millimeter rods basically. The yeah, the power cord, power cord can do that, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know yeah. the power cord? The, the, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if some more shot. Okay. So you can do the moon roll on the bed. Okay. Or even like uh, this not yeah, so some steel cap cap or or they are the flops. Yeah, steel to the nail. So I think yeah, that's about it. But we should uh, someone I could uh who wants to take a stab at redesigning this thing? I, I, I can do that like real quick. Um it's a basic it's a basic thing. Yeah. This thing's got too much meat. Like if you scale this up to like it's just way too much plastic. So, you guys just do it a little better. Like, something about two or three. Can we just stretch I would make it? Yeah, you can, but it's too much plastic waste. It's too heavy. I mean, I would argue know. this not on the critical path, so I'm not sure if we. Yeah, we it's. Want uh, to really focus on this? Maybe uh, not. It's, well, but it's true that without it, it's not going to be a highly functional thing because you're going to get your wires all wrapped up yeah, and it's going to look so well we there that should, we should try to be embarrassed of you. Sure, we do a contraption that routes it kind of. If we can have one uh, adjusted SDL file, make one print, see yeah, we could, it's we viable, that. then we could print them up in the coming weeks. Yeah. You could do something like this here where you're just hanging down. Uh, yeah, like we've got the big, big, uh, yeah, also you can hang this and, then and it'll be. Good enough for now. Yeah, it should be long enough printing. for it. Yeah. Hey! Excuse me. But I like your idea. It's basically never printing some items. We could do this check. Yep. So, yeah, let's let's get out there, get the axes going. I was going to ask if I'll turn 